Okay, if we can get going again. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention before I go on to talk about adenovirus is a question that somebody brought up in the break that I should have pointed out, uh, and that is that the RNA polymerase for the early message for the primary transcript here goes round in the anti-clockwise direction. For the late messages, it's going round in the clockwise direction, and that means in the early stage, it's copying the opposite strand than it's copying in the late stage. So if we say that one of these is Watson and one in Crick, if it's copying the Watson strand in the early phase, it's copying the Crick strand in the late phase. So th there's no rule that the virus has to use one strand or the other. It can use both. And we'll see more examples of that with adenovirus in a minute. Um, and I said there was a very strong enhancer here. And of course, uh, if you remember, enhancers don't have to be in the same orientation. They, they work when they're in either orientation relative to the promoter. Uh, so here, that enhancer can work for the early RNAs as well as the late RNAs, or for the late RNAs as well as the early RNAs. So, were there any other questions? Okay. And I'll start off by going on to adenoviruses. So now we're going up in size. So the uh, papilloma polyomaviruses, polyoma includes polyoma itself, SV40, BKJC, uh, the, those polyomaviruses are around 5 kb. We're now going up to around 30 to 40 kb. So we're going a considerable leap in size. And so the first thing that you're going to expect is everything's going to be more complicated, which it will be, uh, <coughs> which is why we start with the easy ones first. Uh, this adenoviruses are, again, naked icosahedral nuclear capsids. Still, they've still got 12 pentons, the way that all of these icosahedral capsids do, but they've got a lot more hexons uh, because they're bigger capsids, and that's how you make bigger, how you increase the size of your faces, uh, by having more hexons. They're non-enveloped. Um, they, I don't know whether you can see, I'll try taking the light down. Okay. If you look here, this is uh, a carefully chosen picture. They're difficult to see in the actual micrograph. But out of the pentons, there are these fibers that stick out, long, very fragile fibers, most of which appears to just wave in the breeze. And the attachment proteins are actually at the end of these fibers, which would make sense because that's what's going to meet the cell first. Okay, so <coughs> these fibers stick out of here, and that's very characteristic of the adenoviruses, and I don't know of another virus that has this long fiber sticking out like this, so that's, if you see a diagram that looks like this, you know it's adeno. Um, what do adenoviruses cause, just to put you in the picture, and again, you're going to come back and hear about this uh, later on uh, they cause, they tend to infect epithelial cells. So what you see are a, a wide range of illnesses. Not all adenoviruses cause all of these range of illnesses, uh, but you see a wide range of illness uh, associated in these cases with, with problems with your epithelial cell surface. So you see upper respiratory tract infections, you see conjunctivitis, uh, you see GI tract infections, you see cystitis. And in animals, they can cause tumors, but again, fortunately, uh, as far as we're currently aware, they don't cause human tumors. But we have a lot of adenoviruses, and you're going to be hearing about those uh, later on. So what does the virion look like? This is a surface view of the virion. This is the same kind of picture that I showed you before with herpes, where you superimpose, you take pictures in, in the electron microscope without staining it so that it's not shrunken and, and distorted, and then you overlay those, and, and the picture gradually builds up as you put more and more overlays on. All you see is something that's in the same position in every particle. So you don't see the long fibers. You see short stubby fibers, uh, and that's because this part is rigid, and then the rest of it waves in the breeze, and you don't see the part that waves in the breeze with this kind of reconstruction. 
Uh, but this shows you the outside of the adenovirus. This shows you a cross-section through it. This shows you the proteins that are in the adenovirus and do not learn them. I don't know what they are. I don't expect you to know what they are. The, but there is a, a message here, and that is that this virus capsid is much more complicated than the SV40. It's, con it's got a whole pile of capsid proteins um, here. We've got a whole pile of them. It's assembled in a much more elaborate way. Uh, and somebody asked a question about maturation uh, in yesterday's lecture. Uh, and assembling this capsid is a, long, is a complicated process. It requires scaffolding. It's uh, much more difficult to put together than those simple small capsids that you had for SV40. The DNA is inside. It's linear DNA. It's also packaged with a protein, but in this case, it's packaged with an adenovirus protein. So it's not using histones. Uh, and it's a, this is a list of some of the proteins that are present in the core, and some of them are actually associated with the DNA. Uh, so the, the virion is larger, more complicated, built of more proteins. Uh, this is okay because it's got a much bigger genome, but obviously SV40 with its tiny little genome, there's no way it could code for all these number of proteins. Uh, so much more elaborate, uh, and it's not using host cell histones anymore, it's using viral protein, becoming a little bit more independent. But it's still going to go to the nucleus. Uh, so here, adenovirus binds to a receptor on the cell surface. It appears to lose its fibers at this stage as it's taken in. Uh, and then when it gets into endosomes and it's acidified somehow, and this is not well understood, uh, but somehow it causes that endosome membrane to break down and so it just gets into the cytoplasm because the membrane breaks down and it can just get across. Uh, you'd think a lot of viruses might use this approach. Currently, um, we don't know that many viruses do. Adenovirus seems to be fairly special at the moment as far as we're concerned. And again, it, the capsids have got nuclear localization signals on their proteins. They hitch a ride, or at least they've got nuclear transport signals on their uh, capsid proteins. Um, they hitch a ride... Uh, probably on the microtubule system to the nuclear pore, but the capsid again doesn't seem to pass it into the nuclear pore. It looks as if the enzyme, the uh, DNA, and some associated proteins are released, presumably at the nuclear pore, and go through the nuclear pore into the nucleus. And now you've got linear DNA uh, in the nucleus. And again, here's an electron micrograph of these, cell, of these virus particles being engulfed into endosome, endosomes. And as I say, under acidified conditions, something happens. So this is a DNA virus. It's not surprising it's going to the nucleus. Um, <coughs> that's where the treasure trove is if you want to really parasitize the cell. Uh, and it, makes, it has an early phase and a late phase, uh, as all these DNA viruses do. Uh, and in the early phase, it makes... A series of, of copies, a series of genes which are called E genes, E for early. Uh, and what these show here is, again, it's difficult to see here, but there's a sort of pinky colored square bracket here. That square bracket indicates where the promoter is. So from the promoter, you'll have a single primary transcript, and then it's alternatively spliced in a huge number of different ways for adenovirus. It uses alternative splicing really uh, professionally. Um, so here's another one. So here's a promoter. There would have been a single primary transcript which would have been from the, that promoter all the way across here. And then it can go, undergo a pile of alternative fates. And that, what this, these arrows here show are the exons that will appear in final messages. So you can see it indicates a whole pile of possible final messages by splicing these exons together, splicing this other in the nucleus and then the RNA uh, will be shipped to the cytoplasm where it be translated. One thing to notice here is that we had a single block of early genes in SV40. Here we've got a whole pile of early promoters scattered over both strands. So in some cases the RNA is copying the Watson strand, and in other cases it's copying the RNA polymerase is copying the Watson strand, and in other cases it's copying the Crick strand. Uses the host cell RNA polymerase. All of these nuclear DNA viruses use the host cell RNA polymerase. Um, because uh, it's always there. 
so it would seem obvious to use it. So we, not all of our host uh, cells provide DNA synthesis machinery. If you're in a non-dividing cell, you won't be making DNA synthesis machinery. But all of our cells, except for mature erythrocytes, are making RNA. So you can get the messenger RNA machinery is present in all cells. So there's no need to make it for yourself. And it turns out that these DNA viruses um, that go to the nucleus, uh, none of them do make it for themselves, or at least none of the ones we're going to talk about. <clears throat> so this is the host cell RNA polymerase, and it recognizes this early promoter, uh, got a good enhancer on again, because again, you've only got one copy at this stage, and it makes these early genes. And in fact, initially when it goes in, it only makes these two genes. So, so these are made as soon as it goes in. So these are called the immediate early genes. And when these are made, one of these products acts as to enable transcription from the other early promoters. So when it first goes in, the host RNA polymerase only recognizes this E1 position early promoter. It doesn't recognize the E2, the E3, or the E4 early promoter. But in combination with the product of the, what's called the E1, one of the E1A proteins, uh, then it can now recognize these later promoters. So here, the, first of all, what the virus does is it makes an E1A gene product, which enables transcription of the other early RNAs, uh, they're still early. We haven't done any DNA synthesis yet, so they're all early. So sometimes these are called delayed early. Uh, so we have two phases uh, because, as I say, the virus d doesn't just make all these promoters the same. It makes this so that you make the transcription factor, and now you can switch on these other promoters. So what do the early genes code for? Well, obviously, this early gene, one of its functions is to switch on the other early genes. Um, it also makes the things that are needed for DNA synthesis. Uh, and here, what it does is it is going to make its own DNA polymerase. So this virus is going to be independent of the host DNA polymerase to some extent. It's going to make its own DNA polymerase. And that is what this protein is here. It says pol, that's for polymerase. So this virus is going somewhat independent. However, it can't make all the other factors it needs, so it's still going to need the cells to go into S phase to make the deoxynucleotides, etc. Um, the... Yeah. Um, because one of the things is that... Okay. Um... One thing is that by making your own DNA polymerase, that gives you some independence of the host cell because you can get plenty of it and you're not competing with the host cell DNA synthesis. That's one reason. Um, another reason is that this is going to have a slightly different mechanism of DNA synthesis, which makes things fast and rapid and easy. And it also gets around the problem, uh, and I don't want to stress this, but if you do remember back to your biochemistry, you have a problem on the lagging strand at the end because you can't replace the RNA with DNA because there's no primer to do it. This enables it to get around that problem as well. So some of these viruses are doing it to get around the end of the chromosome problem. We have a mechanism for doing it, which is fairly elaborate, and they have a simpler mechanism. They can do things more simply because we're trying to replicate six foot of DNA and keep it under control. And relative to that, they're just trying to replicate a few inches of DNA, and so they can do things much more simply. In addition to which, we can replicate ours once and once only. And if we mess that up, end of story. Where if they're going to make thousands of copies, if they mess it up, as long as some copies are good, they're okay. So there's a whole pile of philosophical answers in there. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Whoops. We went through here. Um, so these... A lot of these genes here are genes that we're going to be talking about because they're needed for this simpl simplified form of DNA synthesis. Um, some of the other genes are involved in modifying host cell immune response. Um, so they enable the adenovirus to grow in the cell uh, and keep our immune response under control at least long enough for it to manage to make new virus particles before the cells are killed. 
Um, others of them actually modify the genes that the host cell is expressing in other ways, uh, and actually some of these push the host cell into some of S phase because we may not need the DNA polymerase, but we need the deoxynucleoside triphosphate, so we need at least some of this. Um, <coughs> and as, so I said, they're needed for DNA synthesis. They're needed to alter the expression of host genes to prevent our immune response getting rid of this cell too early. Um, and they interfere with cell cycle regulation to give uh, the pool of DNA nucleotides that we're going to need to copy it. So all of this is needed to be done prior to DNA synthesis. If you're going to make a DNA polymerase, it has to be done early before DNA synthesis, obviously. Okay. So I said it has a more simple type of DNA replication. Um, here's the linear DNA. Um, what it's going to do, okay, it's going to start copying, always anti-parallel. All these DNA polymerases work 5 prime, 3 prime in an anti-parallel fashion, just the way that all the other polymerases you've talked about do. So it's going to copy this strand in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction. It, the little blue ball shows the polymerase, and as it goes along, it's going to push this strand off. So what we will get is we'll copy this strand entirely and convert it into a pink strand and the top blue strand will be displaced and so this is called the strand displacement mechanism. Now if we did this, if we had six foot of single stranded DNA hanging around in our cell, uh, if, if that got damaged, cleaved, you have no way to put it back together again because you don't know what halves need to go. If you've got double stranded DNA and one strand is clipped, the two, strand, the, the two halves on that side are kept in register because they're hybridized to the other strand, so you can repair them. But if they're not double-stranded, if they're single-stranded, you can't repair them. So this would be an extremely dangerous mechanism for us to use. But this virus has got relatively short RNA, so the chances of it being, if, if your RNA is, supposing that one chromosome's RNA is, is a foot long, uh, if it's cleaved every six inches, it will be in two halves before you replicate it. If this is a few inches long, then it doesn't have much chance of being cleaved if you're only cleaving once every foot or so. So it, it's, most of them will survive. Um, so, this, so now you've got that strand, so what you do is you copy it back in the other direction and make a new strand in this direction. So what you started off with, two blue strands, now you've got one blue and one purple, one blue and one purple. So it looks just like regular DNA replication in that the, the parent molecule, one strand goes to each of the daughter molecules, uh, but it's done by strand displacement where you just get rid of one strand and then replace it with the other. So you don't have a leading and lagging strand here, you just displace the one strand and then you copy that in one go on the way back, which means you don't have to worry about Okazaki fragments and all that sort of stuff. This one is only lagging in terms of it doesn't get copied until it's been completely displaced and you can come back on it. Uh, it doesn't matter which strand, is, which end you start off with, so it turns out you can start off with the other end, displace that bottom strand, in which case you then copy the bottom strand back and you get double-stranded DNA again. It doesn't matter which way. Now, one of the things is that if you remember back to your biochemistry textbooks, uh, DNA synthesis requires a primer. And usually you use RNA in these Okazaki fragments. Uh, but here, I've just shown it as starting at the end. So what can it use as a primer? And this gets back to the question that was raised of why don't we just use the host cell in all these cases. This is a problem. How do you replace that primer and where do you get this primer from in this case? And the answer is that adenovirus doesn't use RNA as a primer. It uses a protein as a primer a terminal protein. And then it hooks a nucleotide onto that, and that terminal protein nucleotide complex, the three prime hydroxyl of that, acts as the site for continuing extension. So it's actually got a single nucleotide on a protein, but the protein aligns it right at the end. The nucleotide hybridizes to this three prime uh, base here, and then it will extend the strand here. So it uses this terminal protein which has a covalently attached nucleotide on it uh, as the primer and uses the three prime hydroxyl of that nucleotide. So that means that that is what acts as the primer, this protein, and then it fills in and goes down there. 
So there is no need to replace anything because it didn't have an RNA primer. It provided a deoxynucleotide which corresponded to the first base here and then extended it. So this is a different way of initiation than you've had, but it's still a primer. It still extends something. It can't start off something from just de novo, like all of the DNA polymerases that we know of. Okay, so when we look at that replication scheme, all these new strands will have this primer, this protein. It's called terminal protein because it's at the end, uh, and they will all have it at the five prime end. So I can put that onto all these purple strands as they're made. They will all have that protein on. Now, of course, the blue strands were made previously, and they were also made with the same mechanism. So the input strands will also have a terminal protein on, so I can put that on. So all of these strands have a terminal protein uh, at the five prime end, because that was what was used to make them. And it's not cleaved off as a rule, it stays there. So if you look back to that vir virion cross-section I showed, it shows a terminal protein as being inside the virus particle. There'll be one, one copy of it on the five prime end, of the, one, of the Watson strand, one copy on the five prime end of the Crick strand. So there'll be two molecules of it in the virion. But because it's in the virion, it's a structural protein, even though it provides no strength or scaffolding or anything. Okay, so this is a much simpler way, but we couldn't possibly afford to let our stuff, our long nucleic acids, be rambling around as single strand stuff. Uh, it's still a problem for adenovirus because single-strand DNA is, is fairly susceptible to being damaged. So actually one of those early proteins is a single-strand binding protein which will bind to this and protect it until it's copied. So as this is being uh, made, the, this single-strand binding protein uh, will come and it will bind to this single-strand displaced DNA and protect it until it's copied back into a double strand. So again, this single strand will also be, and in fact, I didn't show it here, but as this is being copied, the single strand binding protein will, will bind to it as it's being made. So it's protected as soon as it's displaced. That's an early phase protein. All of these, the terminal protein, the DNA polymerase, the single strand binding protein are all early proteins made by adenovirus. But it's relying on the host cell for the deoxynucleoside triphosphates and it also needs some host cell factors that I'm not going to go into here um, to help this DNA polymerase function properly. So it still is using stuff that's available in the nucleus, but those factors are stuff that's available in, in the nucleus, uh, in most nuclei, so it doesn't limit it too much. Okay, any questions on the DNA replication? So... It's doing its own thing. It gives it a little bit more independence. It enables it to make huge numbers of this rather uh, simple uh, genome. It's rather more complicated than SV40, but uh, it's pretty small. And so you get huge numbers of it. And again, it undergoes the same doubling. Every time you double it, the next time it doubles again. So in a very short time, you've got huge numbers of copies. And now you go into the late phase. And so now you, most of the early genes are now down-regulated uh, and the late genes are switched on. And we're not entirely clear what switches them on. There are various uh, hypotheses and it's probably a combination of all of them. Uh, but unlike all those scattered early promoters, which were all over the place, there is a single late promoter. So this is rather more like the SV40 condition, which is here at map position about 15, 16. And that's what's shown by that square bracket there. There will be a single primary transcript which starts at about map position 15 or 16 and goes on to about map position 99. So you just make this one long, large primary transcript. That transcript itself never makes it to the cytoplasm. It undergoes alternative processing. Um, so some will be processed like this one, like this one, etc. So it's got all sorts of alternative fates. Uh, and the net result is, and again, the green shows the exons that will be spliced together to make a mature message that will be shipped to the cytoplasm. And again, all the splicing occurs in the nucleus. Uh, but this is a huge amount of splicing. And I want to stress, why do we need so much splicing? Um, one thing you might think is that you could just take this primary transcript and copy all the individual proteins off it uh, and do it that way. 
but we have a problem with eukaryotic cells, and that's why we see some of the complexities of these viruses. And the problem is what I call the monosystronic message problem. Um, in eukaryotic cells, the message is capped, methylated, and polyadenylated, and the small ribosome subunit, which I haven't shown in huge detail here, um, recognizes this capped, methylated 5' end of the message. It will bind to this, and it will scan along until it finds a nice start codon, and then it will bind to the large ribosomal subunit and protein synthesis will start and it will translate the protein until it meets the stop codon and then it will fall off. And the only way it can get on a message again is to find a 5' prime methylated end and carry on. So if you had a message which had another protein coding region down here with a good start codon and a good stop codon, you would never translate the purple protein because the ribosome always falls off before it gets there. So even if you have multiple coding regions in a message, our ribosomes, as a rule, will only translate the first protein. Now, bacterial ones are different. You can, make a, you can transcribe an operon into a message which has got multiple coding regions, and bacterial ribosomes will recognize the Schein-Dalgarno sequence and bind at the front of each of these and make the separate proteins. So you can have polycystronic functional polycystronic messages in bacteria. But if you have messages which have got more than one cistron, i.e. more than one coding protein region, in eukaryotic cells, you only translate the first one. So with all these viruses, what they're trying to do is, if you want to translate this one, you either have to provide a whole separate promoter and all the controls that go with it, uh, or if you're in the nucleus, you've got access to splicing, so what you can do is you can remove this blue cistron uh, so that the first AUG codon is going to be the AUG here for the purple gene, not the AUG for the blue gene. And so that's what all of this elaborate stuff that Adeno is doing. It's trying to bring the right AUG up to the cap so that it will be the first AUG that will be recognized. So if we go back to this alternate splice acid, alternate processing for this primary transcript. Here, I've just highlighted in purple uh, the gene for one of the hexon proteins, just so that we can follow through what happens. Okay, so here's the primary transcript. And here it is. And if the ribosome, if this gets to the cytoplasm, the ribosomes wouldn't translate it because they'd have fallen off at the first, they'd translate the first protein they met and then fall off, so they'd, all, they'd be concerned with what's down here. So what you need to do is several things. One is um, adenovirus uses alternate, five alternate polyadenylation sites as well. We also have alternate polyadenylation sites for our proteins, and it can affect things like protein stability and stuff like that. Adenovirus has five of them, and that's why these are grouped by L1, L2, L3, L4, L5. Um, in this particular case, it's going to cut here at L3, so this is where it's cutting. So it will cut here and then polyadenylate it. There's a signal here that says, if I'm within 20 nucleotides or 30 nucleotides of the end, then the end should be polyadenylated. So it sees this, it, this wouldn't be polyadenylated here until it's cut. Once it's cut, it says, ah, here's a polyadenylation sequence, and it will go off. Or actually, the polyadenylation sequence also tells it where to cut, but it, and then it will be a polyadenylated. And for some reason, um, we don't know how adenovirus code controls how many are cut at which site. We know really relatively little about the significance of this. So it's then polyadenylated. All of this is going on in the nucleus. Introns are then removed, and in this case it removes a lot here in order to bring the start codon for the hexon protein up, so it's going to be the first start codon in the message. And then it ligates all these together, splices them together, and now what you've got is a relatively short RNA in which the hexon is going to be the first start codon. This can now be go to the pro this can now go to the cytoplasm and be translated. When these nuclear capsid proteins are translated, they've got nuclear localization signals, they hitch a ride on our machinery and get back to the nucleus. Any problems with the splicing? It's just SV40 taken to the nth degree. It's got a much larger genome to do it. 
Um, one thing that, uh, if you notice, is happening here, though, is this initial transcript is going from about 15 to about 99. And if you can remember back to the early genes, we had a lot of early genes that were in this region and early genes that were in this region. So you've got some sequences that are copied both into early RNAs from the Crick strand and late RNAs from the Watson strand, or even late RNAs and early RNAs from the Watson strand. But the Watson strand is, progress, is processed differently um, if the RNA starts at this promoter because the way it's spliced is different than if it started at a promoter out here. So what you have is the same sequence can be used uh, early and late on opposite strands. Oh, I'm just trying to talk about the two strands. Okay. If you've got double-stranded DNA, there's one strand and the other strand. And I don't know how to talk about them, except I just use Watson Crick, since it's Watson Crick. Well, it matters to the virus, because it will always only copy this strand to make its late thing, because the promoter organizes it so that it goes in that particular direction. So. When you're saying Watson, you're saying one that it uses here. Well, no. I, I mean, I've got no code for which I call Watson. Next year, if you watch next year's lectures, you'll probably find I call it Crick. I mean, I'm just using, I'm just using it to distinguish that there are two strands and some are going from one and some are the other. Okay. I could call it strand one and strand two. It's purely arbitrary. <coughs> okay. So it makes all these proteins. And one question is, how does it control all this splicing? It controls five different polyadenylation sites. It controls a huge amount of alternative splicing. And there are some controls, and we don't really understand them very well at the moment. And people are looking at this because it would be an easy way, you would think, to try and follow what goes on in splicing, since you've got a huge amount of the same message being spliced. Uh, it turns out to be a lot more complicated than one might think. But one of the things is, also, the question is, how much control does the virus need? If it makes enough primary transcripts, and enough of those get each of those possible alternative messages as their particular fate. And then as long as there's an excess of those messages, the relative ratios probably doesn't matter too much. So probably what it does is it floods the system. It needs to be sure that all of those alternative fates are represented in the messenger RNA in the cytoplasm, otherwise it's not going to make those proteins. So it needs some kind of crude control. Uh, but it apparently doesn't need a terribly fine control because it just goes overboard and makes a huge amount of late message and a huge amount of these alternatively processed transcripts. The result is you get a huge amount of the proteins that you need to assemble the virus coming back into the nucleus. They've all got these nuclear signals or they come along with a friend who's got a nuclear localization signal. So they, they may not have one themselves, but they bind to another protein that does. So they get back into the nucleus to assemble the capsid. So what, again, you have is, again, we don't seem to have got a good mechanism to get linear DNA out to the cytoplasm to be assembled in the cytoplasm, but we got lots of good methods to get proteins from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. Um, they come into the nucleus. What you get is a lot of nuclear capsid material formed. And I mentioned that with adenovirus, it's so complicated. Actually, some of those proteins are scaffolding proteins so that the capsid is actually built up on a scaffold. And then once it becomes intact and is self-supporting, you can remove the scaffold, you put the DNA inside the virus, and then there's more maturation that occurs as the virus tightens up and closes down and protects that DNA that's inside it. So there's a, it's, it doesn't sort of simply happen just wham, it has a, a, long, it has a, a very orderly defined process of assembly. Uh, but it often fails on the way. You get MC capsids, you get scaffolds that weren't completely coated, you get all sorts of stuff. And this accumulates in the nucleus, just as I said it did with SV40. And you get these inclusion bodies. And this is an electron micrograph of a nucleus. And if I don't know whether you can see from where you're sitting, but these are little regular arrays of these hexagonal uh, in cross-section viruses, these icosahedral viruses. Uh, and some of those will be infectious, and some of them may be empty of DNA and may not be infectious or may be not properly matured or whatever. Uh, but there's a vast number of them. Remember, this is just a thin section. This, is, this will be a whole nucleus in three dimensions. There's tons of virus particles in there. So if you stain this nucleus with something that stains DNA or protein, 
you'll see this, these inclusion bodies in the nucleus, or if you stain it with something that's uh, an antibody that's fluore been fluorescently labelled and it's an antibody to a capsid protein, uh, you'll see that the nuclei light up. Uh, so these inclusion bodies in the nucleus tend to be uh, a hint that you have got um, a DNA virus that's replicating in the nucleus. So they assemble in the nucleus, they undergo maturation, as they say, and then they get out of the cell because the cell is lysed. By this stage, um, the cell is uh, getting sick uh, and it lyses uh, either via apoptosis, although adenovirus tends to inhibit apoptosis. Uh, it has this same thing. It wants DNA synthesis to start occurring. It doesn't care too much about DNA polymerase, but it does care about its de deoxynucleoside triphosphates. So the cell is pushed into inappropriate DNA synthesis. It tries to commit apoptosis to keep things right and proper. Um, the, apoptosis, the adenovirus inhibits that. So uh, it takes a long while for the cell to die, which gives adenovirus time to do its thing. So these will eventually lyse. The plasma membrane will lyse. The nuclear membrane will lyse. And these particles will get out into the medium and be able to go on uh, and infect other cells. Uh, so, things to note. Well, are there any questions about that for sure? So, some of the things that, to note about adenoviruses, they're larger and they're more complex than papova viruses. Um, they have got some of their own independence. They code for their own DNA polymerase, and that means they can use a, a relatively fast and rapid and tailored method to amplify their, RNA, their DNA. And it means they don't have to worry about the end problem uh, SV40, of course, had circular DNA, and that's one way to get around that problem. If you've got linear DNA, you have the problem of how do you replicate the extreme ends on the lagging strand, and they found a way to do it by using that terminal protein uh, as a primer. Um, their early genes are scattered, so you don't quite have this simplistic one early pr promoter, one late promoter, but you do have one late promoter, and you have a huge amount of alternate processing so that that late promoter can code for the large number of proteins that it needs to code for. And the host cell is providing the accessory factors for DNA synthesis and the nucleotides. It's providing the RNA synthesis machinery and the modification enzymes, including the capping, methylation, polyadenylation, splicing. Uh, so it's not surprising. It still has to go to the nucleus uh, because or it doesn't have to go to the nucleus, but it's not surprising that these DNA viruses tend to go to the nucleus because they're still getting a lot of advantages in the nucleus. And one is the RNA synthesis machinery, uh, the RNA modification machinery, and the RNA splicing machinery because that enables it to use one message to code for a huge number of proteins. And also, as I say, you can have one sequence that's a part of early messages and late messages. Um, it provides you, it means you can get all the presence of alternative splicing means you can get a lot of bang for the buck or a lot of bang for a killer base pair of DNA. Uh, and splicing machinery, uh, these big splicesomes, they're in the nucleus. Uh, and so if you're going to use splicing, you got, you've got to go to the nucleus. The other thing I haven't mentioned, but it does seem that when we make RNA, we, this RNA polymerase is a factory. And so it seems that it goes around and it binds to the RNA and makes the RNA, but the capping methylation and polyadenylation enzymes become associated with that factory. So if you want to cap and methylate and polyadenylate, you need to be with the RNA polymerase as part of the complex. Um, so what you have to do, you can't just make an RNA and then say, cap me, methylate me, polyadenylate me. If you weren't made as part of the complex, you didn't get your capping and methylation and polyadenylation as you went right past the right part of the factory line. Uh, so in order to get cap methylated and polyadenylated effectively, um, you probably have to use the host RNA polymerase because that's the only way you get onto the factory line to get all the, uh, those other modifications made. Splicing is slightly different. It seems you can go to the splicing machinery. That seems to be independent some extent. But the capping methylation and polyadenylation appear to be associated with the RNA polymerase so that as the RNA is made, it, the RNA just sort of floats past these and they modify them as it goes past. Okay, and this is just the overall view just because uh, 
it might help when you're reviewing things. Okay. So there are any questions on adenoviruses? So we're going to go up another sort of five-fold increase in size to herpes viruses. So after what I've said so far, you might expect these to have more complicated virus particles to do more for themselves, to be more independent. And one thing, remember, is when they're independent, they provide targets. Now, the pharmaceutical companies at the moment have not found that adenovirus is worth too much of their attention, so they haven't been developing antivirals for adenovirus. But if we suddenly find an adenovirus that causes cancer or does something really nasty, um, we're going to be immediately interested. And the obvious thing to do, if you're a pharmaceutical country, would be to go after analogues of the nucleotides in order to try and inhibit that DNA polymerase because we've had a lot of success with analogues of those nucleotides for herpes and for retroviruses. They have a huge stock. They just have to screen which type of family would work and adapt it from there. So if we have a really serious adenovirus uh, that's worthwhile developing medications for, um, they already know where to start because that's a weak link. It's doing its own DNA synthesis. Okay, herpes viruses. So they too have an icosahedral nuclear capsid. I showed you a movie of that. Um, this is a similar picture. It's somewhat more high definition, and I doubt you can see from here, but there's some slightly different looking subunits here, which are pentons with five neighbors, a penton here with five neighbors, a penton here with five neighbors, and then on the faces we've got six neighbors. So this has got one, two, three, four, five, six neighbors. I can see it. I don't suppose you can, but there are pentons and hexons on this virus, like all of these icosahedral viruses. Okay, this virus has an envelope, a lipid bilayer, and it gets that by pushing through a host cell plasma membrane as a rule. Um, so it gets it always by pushing through a host cell membrane, uh, and in this case, usually the plasma membrane. Uh, and it's, so it's a lipid bilayer. It's your plasma membrane that provided this for the virus. Uh, but before the virus picked it up, it had inserted some of its proteins into your plasma membrane so that when it picked it up, it had got the proteins it needed in the envelope. And um, it's, this virus has got a pile of these glycoproteins, transmembrane glycoproteins. You have transmembrane glycoproteins in your plasma membrane that are things like receptors for growth factors, etc. Um, and it uses the same signaling translocation machinery to get its proteins into the plasma membrane. Uh, and it has quite a lot of these glycoproteins. You'll be hearing more about these from Dr. Ganjemi. Uh, I'm, some of these herpes virus people tend to use some different language, so I'm going to sort of introduce some of it. I did provide a glossary at the end of the introductory lecture. That glossary, you don't have to learn it, but if you've got any questions about terms, I put some of the terms that people keep asking about in there so that you have a reference. Um, these are glycoproteins. Most membrane proteins are. They're glycosylated on their way to the surface in the Golgi apparatus, if you remember. Um, these are glycoproteins, and frequently we just talk about them as viral glycoproteins. One at least of these will function as an attachment protein because that's got to recognize the receptor on the next cell. Uh, sometimes if they stick out and are clearly visible, they're called spikes. And the old term for them was peplomas and I don't quite know what peplo means. Um, I guess it probably means spike. Uh, but um, it's sometimes used in the older books, and for some reason it tends to have been to be used by the herpes people uh, more than it's by most other people. Maybe, I don't know why. Okay, in between the envelope and the nuclear capsid, there is a, a protein, a very organized protein layer, um, and this is uh, herpes viruses. Um, as I say, they've got large genomes, and they have this organized uh, protein layer, and we're not going to see another virus with this kind of organization. Other viruses have got some proteins here, but this has got uh, many proteins in here in, a, in an organized fashion, and it's known as the tegument, um, which means the cloak or the outer part of it. Uh, so it. But it's here between the envelope and the virus particle, and it's got some very important proteins in that I shall be mentioning. Okay, so here's a, um, a negative stain picture of a herpes virus. The envelope has got really damaged by the negative stain. 
if you don't, as I say, if you don't maltreat these viruses, it would be a, a, a nice spherical membrane, it turns out. So this is a highly damaged one. And you can see these nuclear capsid, capsimers here, uh, and they tend to have a little dimple in the middle, but it doesn't go all the way through. The DNA inside is completely protected. Uh, so I said it's about five times as large as adeno. It includes its herpes simplex viruses, both HSV1, which you tend to get above the waist, fever blisters, so on, uh, HSV2. Um, it includes Epstein-Barr virus, which is associated with infectious mononucleosis. And it includes the virus which is, causes chickenpox, which is known, a disease that was known uh, as varicella, and shingles, which is a disease that was known as zoster. So when you first get it, you get chickenpox. And then these viruses, once you've got them, you've got them for life. If it reactivates, it tends to reactivate as shingles. And you'll be hearing about that from Dr. Gingemi. So this is called varicella, varicella zoster virus because it causes both. Or sometimes it's called varicella virus or, and herpes zoster virus. It's all the same virus. It's reflecting the fact that it caused two diseases and it took virologists and physicians uh, centuries to discover that fact. So it binds to the cell surface. Uses the same way I talked about before with the plasma membrane. So I've shown you all this before, and it gets into the cell by fusion with the plasma membrane, and then this becomes continuous with the plasma membrane. Um, I just want to briefly point out one consequence of this. I've already stressed in yesterday's lecture that this happens with herpes viruses, paramyxoviruses, and HIV. They fuse with the plasma membrane because they've got a fusion protein that will work at physiological pH. The other viruses tend to work at acidic pH, and they won't do this. They have to be taken into the cell before they can fuse. But when this virus replicates, it will put this protein into the viral membrane because it's going to need it in the viral membrane for when the virus gets out so that it can pick it up here. So when you've got, if we look at an uninfected cell here and an infected cell here, it will put that attachment protein and the other glycoproteins into the plasma membrane so that when it buds out, it will get all these proteins as it buds out. Then the problem is that this, prote this infected cell will have these proteins. If it's against an uninfected cell, what happens? This attachment protein will bind to the receptors here, so this attachment protein will bind to these receptors. So what you will get is the, uninf the infected cell will bind to the uninfected cell. At, at neutral pH, this will cause fusion, so these two cells will fuse. So it will cause cells to fuse. So what you get are herpes viruses, paramyxoviruses, HIV, because they put their fusion proteins into the infected cell plasma membrane, and because that fusion protein can work at physiological pH, the pH on the outside of the plasma membrane, it will cause two plasma membranes to fuse because as far as it's concerned, all it needs is it needs to be in one membrane and see an attachment pro uh, a receptor in another membrane. What this means then is when you get these cells that are infected with herpes viruses, you get these multinucleate cells. The nuclear membranes don't fuse. It's just the plasma membranes. But what it enables the virus to do is pass from one cell to another without having to go out and meet your antibodies. So it's not such good news. And so here is a staining of a cell from a vesicle that somebody had. Uh, they actually had it just on one part of their face, a dermatome. And this was shingles. When, it, when it's reactivated, it tends to just be reacted from one root of the nerves, and it just uh, comes out in one dermatome. But part of the thing was you can quickly take a vesicle scraping. There's tons of these cells in it. You can look at these cells, and you can see these few cells with multiple nuclei, uh, and this indicates you've got a fusing virus. Given the patient's symptoms, it was unlikely to be HIV. Um, given the other symptoms, it wasn't likely to be any. Uh, it wasn't likely to be a paramyxovirus, so it's likely to be a herpes virus. Um, that seems kind of trivial in a way, uh, but when smallpox and herpes were circulating, in you wanted to quickly, in the days before any of this high-tech stuff, determine whether somebody had got smallpox or somebody got herpes. You would take a scraping from the vesicle and use this so-called sank smear. Uh, and if you saw these, fused, these uh, syncytial cells with multinuclei, uh, 
uh, you breathed a sigh of relief because it indicated that they got herpes, a herpes virus, either uh, a herpes simplex, fever blister type things, or chicken pox. Chicken pox was the problem because chicken pox presents looking rather like smallpox. So you need to make a quick diagnosis because you don't know whether to tell them just to look after Johnny or whether you need to put an all-scale alert out. Um, so whether you cause syncytia or not is, is important. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'll answer any questions or I'll answer them tomorrow.